Hello folks, so I am here again with the next slew of topics before you and since COVID is hitting again, so the issue of migrants become really important because we saw how Indian migrants within country suffered a lot due to a sudden lockdown and the debate about, around migrants internationally uh, becomes prominent time and again. For example, recently when the FIFA World Cup was happening, a lot of reports, ground reports were coming that how their basic human rights were violated and a lot of migrant workers actually died while preparing the stadium and etc. other things with regard to uh, the FIFA World Cup. So uh, that will be an issue today. So the issues which I am covering today is first is in Indian migrants in the Gulf country. Uh, there was a write-up in Hindu. Second, Uniform Civil Code trying to reframe the debate. Again, there was a write-up by Mr. Gautam Bhati in Hindustan Times. Then there are international developments in the form of uh, your US-Africa summit which happened in December. Then uh, recently general elections were held in Nepal and again it, it, it threw a spanner in the form of hung assembly and in the last moment itself uh, the old coalition died under the umbrella of Nepali Congress and uh, the uh, Maoists have actually regrouped again and Prachand will be the new Prime Minister in Nepal. The next news uh, is regarding some national developments like uh, the winter session is going on and the issues have been raised regarding the delayed wages in Manrega. Then uh, your second debate is around delimitation because uh, 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 they are planning to start delimitation in, in some northeastern states and uh, with respect to delimitation only certain MPs, member of parliaments from south have raised question uh, regarding uh, the news uh, which is circulating, you call it a news or conspiracy theory or, or uh, uh, the news from other sources which say that the government might increase the number of uh, seats in the Lok Sabha. It might happen soon in 2026. Uh, we don't know the authenticity of the news, but yeah, there is a debate around that. Uh, then I I, uh, I will give you a topic for essay which I found in Hindu. It's a good statement which can which may or may not drop in your uh, UPSC. So moving on, the Indian migrants in Gulf. So why news? Because International Migrants Day was observed on December 18 and again the debate around the issues of migrants have become prominent in the wake of uh, the COVID wave which is hitting China. And before that, the uh, basic rights of migrants were being talked about in your FIFA World Cup when a lot of news were coming where it was seen that uh, uh, a lot of migrants, uh, labor, uh, these mostly blue collar workers died and uh, the, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the the hosting country Qatar tried to uh, hide uh, everything under the carpet. So there is a question which I picked up from the write up only. Migration is not uniform across the world, and it is shaped by economic, geographic, demographic, and other factors resulting in distinct migrant patterns. Critically examined. So. UPSC is in the habit of picking up statements from the newspapers. I found this statement important. So it is talking about the multidimensionality of the migration process. Even if it's, uh, it's not in the form of question, you can use this line in order to sum up your answers regarding your migration or if a question or if an essay come on migration, okay, you can make use of that. There are a few facts which, uh, which I would like to put forth you that uh, according to International Organization of Migration, World Migration Report 2022, there are some 281 million international migrants and two-thirds out of them are labor and out of these many migrants, some 40% are actually from South Asia and South Asia Gulf Migratory Corridor is the world's largest migrant corridor. So you can imagine uh, that uh, in fact uh, the migrants to uh, your Gulf countries are actually sustaining a lot of economy in Kerala and uh, if if any any uh, sort of thing happens it might uh, destabilize the whole economy of Kerala so South Asia Gulf migrant corridor is one of the largest in the world and recently uh, the issues regarding 
uh, your unemployment, underemployment, reduction in salaries, non-payment of salaries, irregular payment, poor working conditions, negation of labor rights, absence of proper grievance redressal mechanism, and access to transparent judicial system. All these issues have become really important. In fact, so much imp so important that civil society members are actually leading a movement known as Justice for Wage Theft. And countries like Philippines are actually considering legal measures against this justice for wage theft. You must also remember that uh, there is a kafala system which actually operates in Gulf countries. What is kafala system? This is a sponsorship program that the uh, citizens of Gulf countries, they can sponsor the migrant labors. And the moment the migrant labors enter the, uh, the Gulf countries, their passport, etc., visa, etc., that's all been uh, kept uh, under the patronage or under the protection of the kafil, the, the one who sponsors them. So, uh, you can say that uh, this is a modern form of slavery. Beware. The migrant worker is not free to choose employer, is not free to transfer employment, is not free to end the services as and when it wants. So you have to link this uh, kafala system with the definition of forced labor uh, given by international labor organization. According to it, forced labor is all work or services which is exacted from any person under the threat of penalty and for which person has not offered himself or herself voluntarily. So if we analyze this definition, it has got three elements. The first one is work or service and refers to all types of work occurring in any activity, be it industry, sector, including informal economy as well. The second one is the menace of penalty, which refers to the wide range of penalties used to compel someone to work. And the third one is uh, offered the nature of work should be should be offered voluntarily which refers to free and informed consent of the work to take a job his her freedom to leave anytime but under kafala system this actually does not happen and this is the reason that uh, uh, united nations through its non-binding resolution global compact for safe orderly and migration and regular migration it recognizes the challenges that migrant labor faces across the world, and especially in the post-pandemic world. And it is therefore uh, expected from the government of India that they come up with a proper migration policy. Firstly, secondly, the migration is actually governed by uh, uh, an act enacted by Britishers in, in in the early in the late 19th century. So there is a bill pending pending in parliament known as Emigration Bill 2021. The government should take cognizance of all these issues, uh, all the problems being faced by the migrant workers in in the blue collar in uh, in, in your blue collar industry. Okay, and the most important point is that the in the India is known for hospitality hospitality sector. So India has actually India exports lot of nurses and these nurses and caregivers work in the most volatile countries such as Iraq, Syria, uh, uh, Libya, Yemen, Israel and remotest Papua New Guinea. So women workers venture to these countries uh, through mostly recruitment agencies and therefore government should comprehensively access the situation of migrant women and create women centric right based policy so within uh, the whole uh, your demography of migrant workers women are also vulnerable there is also one interesting point here that we might expect that this kind of discrimination on everything happens only with respect to blue collar workers but this is not correct recently in us also uh, uh, the tech industry, uh, the day great tech boom, uh, which actually Indians have heralded in USA. There have been cases in last two, three years where they have started talking about the caste discrimination they face there uh, within their own cohorts. So in 2020, California's Department of Fair Employment and Housing brought a suit against Cisco and two of its Indian employees after one of Dalit employees alleged harassment based on caste. And similar reports have come in Bloomberg, Washington Post, etc., where a lot of uh, tech workers have actually complained with regard to the uh, kind of caste discriminations that they face within the country. So you can use all these as a case study, mostly sociology and Paul science students. You make make use of this. And uh, related to that, there is an interesting book by Rajimon Kutipan, uh, undocumented stories of Indian migrants in Arab Gulf. 
uh, you can just like um, these are basically a uh, first hand uh, uh, account of how labors have, are facing kind of things but he shows a positive side of migration also that it might seem that everything is really bad which is actually bad but when it's not just the poverty that forces people to move out of India to the Gulf countries in search of uh, such difficult conditions. It's more about equality. When they reach there, they see that everybody in their hardships are equal. They can start equally from the same place. And there is no mafia in job market as such which you face in India. Where there, there is a caste discrimination, where there is a class discrimination, they do not face that kind of thing when they move to Gulf countries. So this is one positive aspect of why migration actually happened to the Gulf countries. This is what we did. Kafala system, what are the problems, definition of forced labor according to international labor organization, etc, etc. These all issues can be incorporated in one answer. Uh, when a question regarding troubles of migration issue or how COVID has impacted the migrant laborers, etc. And you can uh, also put in the scope of uh, the lens of the views of women, uh, their, their specific problems because Indian nurses are working in some of the most hostile countries as of now. Okay, so this was our uh, first uh, news pick for the day. Moving on, second is Uniform Civil Court trying to reframe the debate. So why news uh, recently in Lok Sabha uh, last year and even in Uttarakhand, uh, the newly appointed CM has actually went ahead and he has said that he will frame a legislative committee to look into the matter of Uniform Civil Court. In fact, Honorable Supreme Court also in, in one of his hearing, in their hearing, they said Goa is a shining example because Goa has... Uh, a uniform civil code sort of thing. It's a different debate that how effective is that. We are not getting into that. So this is all debate which is just coming up. So I would like you to take through the debates around uniform civil code. And we must know that <coughs> Article 44 of the Constitution, it lays down that state shall endeavor to secure a uniform civil code for the citizens throughout the territory of India. So now there, there, there was right up way back by uh, Faizan Mustafa. He has been the VC of uh, NLSIU, uh, uh, NLS Hyderabad and <clears throat> he, he gives interesting point. So he writes a uniform civil code is one that would provide for one law for the entire country applicable to all religious communities in their personal matters such as marriage, divorce, inheritance, adoption etc. Article 44 lays down this particular condition for India. But then he goes on to get into the legal technicalities around Uniform Civil Code. For example, Article 37 uh, makes fun, uh, directive principles actually non-justiciable because they are not enforceable by any court. But so Honorable Supreme Court through its various judgment has tried to make a balance between FR and DPSPs and it has actually made DPSPs also in in in, in, uh, in a lot of cases sort of enforceable. Then moving on, uh, our, while article 44 uses the word state shall endeavor, other articles in DPSP uses words such as in particular strife, shall in particular direct its policy, shall be obligation of the state etc etc. Article 43 again mentions states shall endeavor by suitable legislation. Okay, emphasis is on suitable legislation. But the phrase by suitable legislation is absent in Article 44 as you can see that. All this implies that the duty of the state is greater in other DPSPs rather than in Article 14. Similarly, when, when you see Article 25, when it talks about indiv individual freedom of speech and ex uh, individual freedom of religion, it is actually restricted to public morality, etc. But when you see Article 26, which talks about groups' right, religious rights uh, belonging to group, it does not talk about th those kind of restrictions and all, or uh, th those kind of reasonable restrictions as we see in Article 25. So, can state interfere for making laws into the minority rights etc uh, this is a debate and uh, and that is why we see that uh, every now and then in fact uh, in a lot of bjp ruled states they have promised that it will go for legislative committees which will look into the matter of uniform civil code and in fact the grandson of uh, first education minister uh, molana azad uh, 
uh, he actually filed a PIL in Supreme Court and he says that Uniform Civil Court will actually bring in the nationalist fervor around the country and it is a time, it is a need of the hour that this should happen ASAP. Uh, moving on, uh, we have to get into the various debates. So, does India have a Uniform Civil Code? In lot of civil and criminal laws, actually India follows the Uniform Civil Code. For example, in your various civil laws like Indian Contract Act, Civil Procedure Code, Series of Good Acts, Transfer of Property Act, Partnership Act, Evidence Act, etc. But again here, states have made so many amendments that across states you will feel the difference between these uh, secular laws, secular civil laws also. Also, the framers of Indian Constitution had they intended that Uniform Civil Court should be the exclusive jurisdiction of Parliament, they would have simply uh, put personal laws in the central list. But what they have done is they have put into the concurrent list. And last year, the Law Commission itself concluded that Uniform Civil Code is neither feasible nor desirable. But the Honorable uh, Law Minister recently has said that 22nd Law Commission may take up the issue with respect to Uniform Civil Code. Also, uh, uh, although we have Hindu, uh, uh, the Hindu code bills have been codified in, in the time of Jawaharlal Nehru itself, but again, that law is not uniform and a lot of, uh, like, for example, there is something known as Hindu undivided family, okay, you have tax uh, benefits in that. So, if a uniform civil code do comes in, Hindu community might have to give away this tax benefits which actually accrues to them through Hindu undivided family laws. So, even within the codification also, Hindu code bills etc, we find that uh, a lot of time the old customary laws have been preserved in the Hindu code bill in its practice also. And also with regard to Muslim community, uh, again there is a variance across the state. For example, registration of marriage among Muslim law differ from place to place. It's what it was compulsory in Jammu and Kashmir. It's optional in Bengal, Bihar, Assam and Odisha. And also in Northeast, there are more than 200 tribes with their own varied customary laws. And the constitution itself protects local customs in Nagaland, Meghalaya, Mizoram. So actually constitution is talking about the asymmetries of religions and communities across India. And uh, 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 during constituent assembly debates, uh, for example, Muhammad Ismail, he, he, for tries he tried unsuccessfully to get Muslim personal law exempted from Article 44. Then P. B. Poker Sahib said he had received representations against Common Civil Code, and uh, and even B. R. Ambedkar said that no government can use its provision in a way that would force Muslims to revolt. And Aladi Krishna Swami, who was in favor of Uniform Civil Code, conceded that it would be unwise to enact. Uniform Civil Court ignoring strong opposition from any community. So there were debates, debate is not yet settled. That's why uh, the framers of Indian Constitution, they made it a DPSP and it, it actually left to the uh, rationality of the future generation to come to look into the desirability and feasibility of a Uniform Civil Court. But one interesting point is during all these debates, gender justice was missing from the debate of Uniform Civil Court. And you know, uh, the feminists like Susan Moeller Okin, and uh, they actually uh, criticize this approach of multiculturalism where a lot of leeway is being given to minority communities. So they say that actually this multiculturalism or this form of giving over protection to the religious codes of minorities actually harm, harms the interest of women. And state should actually intervene. Only then state will be able to provide justice to each and everybody. So, uh, this debate actually, uh, when while was happening in Constituent Assembly, uh, the gender justice issue was actually missing from the debate of Uniform Civil Code. So, this brings me to the write-up by Gautam Bhatia in Hindustan Times. He says, the debate should be framed not with regard to uniformity of civil code. Rather, the debate should be framed in a manner that all, all communities, all parties to this debate should actually agree on a gender just uh, code based on your uh, base of the Indian constitution and uh, choices should be given to the communities and people whether they want to be governed by a uniform code or by their personal laws itself. 
and as long as this choice is based upon the a wholesome notion of gender justice there can be no problem uh, wh uh, whether we can have a uniform civil code or not for example a lot of time uh, interfaith couples want to get married under special marriage act so they shun their personal laws and go and uh, get married under special marriage act so there is already a provisions uh, uh, we should explore the debate in that domain this was a write up by gautam bhatia where he says that we can actually go for this i will I will read uh, <coughs> a line that once the starting point of the debate is changed, it's easy to see how much of it becomes uh, easier to go with the debate. He says, as long as personal laws are not violating anyone's right and treating everyone with equal concern and respect, there is no particular reason why in a country as diverse and plural as India, people should not be given the opportunity to opt in or opt out of those regimes. In other words, if a person is free to choose whether they want to be governed by personal law or by non-religious civil code, there is no reason why UCC and personal laws cannot coexist. So, now this is by Gautam Bhatia in Hindustan Times. You may give it a read. So, this is the basic debate around uniform civil code and a few write-ups which I try to merge here and there. I hope you can bring about all these issues when you write an answer next and you can always see i put in gender justice because you can always use that you can always score some extra point when you try to bring multi-dimensional perspective in a debate okay uh, then uh, moving on uh, some international developments are there uh, this time i am trying something new so first international development is that uh, it was the uh, second US Africa summit, which was held in Washington uh, from 13 to 15, mostly virtual. Uh, President Joe Biden joined virtually, and there were some 49 delegates from uh, uh, Africa. And this time, uh, President Biden has promised that he would visit African continent soon. And also, uh, uh, in, from investment point of view, uh, US announced new investment and initiatives like $21 billion to IMF to provide access to necessary financing for low and middle income countries, then $10 million for a pilot program to boost security capacity of African partners. And administration has also indicated that it is planning to invest $55 billion in Africa over the next three years, working closely with the Congress of the United States. And Joe Biden gave a statement that US is all in on Africa and all in with Africa. You can actually use this quote. Okay, when even if a question on India Africa relations come in, you can say give the importance of Africa. Like uh, late uh, Foreign Minister Srimati Shush Shushma Swaraj used to say that Africa is our mother continent. So you can relate all these things. But how things become complicated? See, India is heading the presidency of G20 and India is actually focusing on global south. But if we compare India and like even the why US is doing such a reach out, we see the presence of China. So that uh, China's presence is, with respect to trade in Africa is to the tune of $254 billion and US is only $44.9 billion. In fact, China has institutionalized the process of engagement with Africa in the form of Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, FOCOC. It was established in 2000. And in 2018, FOCAC summit, uh, they, uh, Be Beijing and Africa are actually trying to build a China-Africa community that strives for a win-win cooperation. And, you know, for years, the Chinese foreign ministry begins their annual series of foreign visits by traveling to Africa first. So they start their visit uh, from Africa. What India can do, since India is heading G20, to start with, India can actually help African Union uh, to become the member of G20. Uh, secondly, uh, India should ASAP, as soon as possible, go for fourth India-Africa Forum Summit because last was held in 2015 and since then uh, we haven't been able to call for the fourth summit. It should happen before 2023, 2024, whenever it's possible. And uh, go Modi government actually should, it has actually focused, it has given momentum 
for high legible exchanges and completing the projects and that momentum should keep going on so this was the first development why africa is important related to this only since we are talking about global south uh, there is a write up in hindustan times by mr atul mishra and atul mishra is actually teaches international relations at shivnadar in institution of mna and here he is saying that in g20 also india will focus on the issues of global south like sustainability climate change or uh, aid etc but india should not lose the sight of geopolitics okay uh, uh, the indian cultural uh, strategic culture has been to folk, uh, divide the world into two two uh, divisions it india sees global north in terms of geopolitics for example the great power rivalry which is uh, uh, till now used to be between ussr and usa but now it's happening between china and us and then it divides the world into issues such as of global south like sustainability peace un peacekeeping etc etc but according to the author atul mishra he says that in order to make itself effective in the platforms like g20 irrespective of the fact that india will keep on focusing on the issues of global south india should not forget that there is the geopolitics of global north which will actually shape the effectivity and effectiveness of indians in india's initiative in any forum so india should not lose the sight of the geopolitics of the north in fact india should stop seeing into binaries of global uh, geopolitics of global north and non geopolitical issues of the global south in fact they in, uh, affect each other and india should carve out its strategy in that particular format only this was another news with respect to uh, your uh, 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 how to go about global south Uh, moving on recently elections were held in nepal and two write ups have come up one is by mr rakesh sood in your uh, hindu the topic is nepal politics past present and future another one is in hindustan times which says twist in nepal poses a new challenge to india and this write up is by mr akhilesh upadhyay he is also a research scholar so i am not getting into the politics we know how hung politics hung parliament do comes up in 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 your uh, Uh, nepal uh, the elections at all the levels were held in 2017 for the first time uh, based on the constitution adopted in 2015 and uh, uh, recently again elections were held in two, uh, in november and uh, till till end uh, there was a coalition by nepali congress the incumbent but then in the last moment only uh, the communist party uh, they came out of the coalition they formed their own government and uh, prachanda uh, he has some 30 days to prove his majority there is a unique thing in nepal's constitution that you cannot bring no confidence motion once the government has been formed for for initial 2 years okay and uh, but government might have to seek confidence motion see there is a difference between no confidence and confidence okay for 2 years you cannot bring no confidence but if government is not able to pass certain bill in the, the house obviously it's lacking confidence and government might have to bring the confidence motion so this is the politics which is actually going on there the interesting point to note here is or the unique point to note here is that uh, the communist party uh, okay they are actually coming together again uh, kp oli actually uh, his regime was not very sympathetic towards the indian cause indian issues and indian causes and we see a lot of disruptions actually happen under un, under his prim, premiership uh, so when the communist party is coming to nepal they are, the coalition is coming to nepal uh, there are chances that they will again uh, move slowly closer to uh, china and uh, immediately like after uh, this uh, prachanda came big be, uh, became the prime minister uh, china actually opened the uh, rasuwa gadhi uh, border post and it sent a team to look into the feasibility of trans himalayan railways and should be remember that till now there is there has been not a single bri project which has been commissioned in nepal and the erstwhile government of deva it actually said uh, very clearly to beijing that uh, it cannot borrow heavily uh, Uh, for the bri projects and uh, nepal was actually cautious but now we may see that uh, beijing is already making the moves 
and even US should get wary because this year itself Nepal parliament ratified US sponsored Millennium Challenge Corporation which actually funded 500 million dollar for the reconstruction of Nepal. Uh, India, what's the role for India? So India first of all should try to resolve some bone of contention. The first being Indian currency issue pending since 2016 demonetization. So they would, uh, the talks between two central ba banks need a political nudge. Second is recruitment of Gurkha regiments held up since launch of Agnipat scheme. It should be uh, uh, actually fast paced. And uh, we should remember what Mr. Modi said that relationship needs equality, mutual trust, respect and benefit to sustain it. India has actually shown an urgency, for example, uh, to, since 2022, Jayanagar uh, Bardi Bas railway station, uh, railways was started. It was, uh, the technical assistance was provided by India. Second, in 2019, the long-awaited Motihari Amlekh Ganj oil pipeline was inaugurated. Uh, another achievement is power generation in Nepal has picked up the agreement to export 364 megawatts signed in June last year. This year has yielded export earnings of some 60 million dollar in 2022, and uh, there are chances in 2023 uh, 900 megawatt Arun 3 will become operational. So India is actually showing uh, a lot of urgency in Nepal, but there are issues, and even US sh should take the note of it. Uh, these are the issues. Uh, moving on, uh, there is another write-up uh, again in Hindustan Times by Shanti Marriott D'Souza and actually she is focusing upon uh, the hot politics which is actually taking place in Pakistan-Afghanistan relationship and recently there were news that Taliban actually uh, 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 captured certain posts in Pakistan and uh, Taliban is actually uh, very uh, aggressive uh, at the Duran line and they have actually refused to accept the Duran line. They are not letting Pakistani administration to fence the border and uh, earlier it was, uh, Pakistan was really gung-ho last year that uh, the long game it actually played in Afghanistan, uh, the, the time to get the fruition out of it have actually come up but that's not happening. Uh, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan is very aggressive, even Haqqanis are of no help. And it was expected that Pakistan will actually create divide and rule between two factions. One is hardliner Taliban known as Kandahar Shura, another is pragmatist Doha Shura. But this has actually not happened. And in fact, uh, the agreement uh, which was reached between uh, uh, Pakistan ad administration, military, Tehreek e Taliban, this is uh, actually anti Pakistani forces. But that agreement have actually uh, uh, broken down and uh, uh, Tehreek e Taliban is actually very active. Uh, it is uh, creating havoc ar around the, those regions of Pakistan. And the major uh, issue with respect to Afghanistan is they are trying to gain legitimacy. They are fighting the common adversary in form of Islamic State of Khorasan province. And they are not actually happy with regard to uh, Islamabad's disinclination uh, for not recognizing Taliban regime yet. And time and again, the Afghan Taliban is looking for avenues for image makeover and they have actually outreached to India in the form of uh, assistant to train the troops and they are trying to depict that uh, when it comes to Pakistan, Afghanistan is actually taking an independent foreign policy and uh, this is the reason that even government of India has shed its initial inhibitions, hesitations and have actually tried to engage with Taliban because uh, this could be an appropriate time where India may use or India may actually curtail the strategic depth of Pakistan and Afghanistan. So these all views become important. It can be used uh, regarding the emerging situation in our India's extended neighborhood or, or India's northern western backyard. So uh, you may, uh, the, uh, the write-up's title is Taliban resistance is a setback for Pakistan. And she's saying that Pakistan is facing a classic blowback. The patron client relationship with Afghan Taliban is actually backfiring on Pakistan itself. So these were some international developments. Moving on, we'll talk about some uh, national developments also. For example, uh, a debate was uh, there in your 
that 18 states are yet to receive 4700 crore manrega wages and uh, the share of west bengal is highest the government of india the union is actually saying that uh, there are a lot of uh, intricacies and technical issues which west bengal government has not been able to fulfill but then again we can see this in a larger context of politics but why this news becomes important i would like to focus that section 3 of manrega act actually says that wage payment should be made within 15 days this is not happening there is wage delays and uh, earlier this was due to uh, overhauling of public financial management system but now the government has actually made digital capture of manrega's attendance mandatory at work despite issues such as lack of technical support necessity to own a smartphone and workable internet connection these all are the problems so when a question on manrega and feasibility and implementation issues comes or in your ethics paper also if the question on good governance etc extra come you can make use of all these examples so uh, uh, also uh, there was an audit which happened some two three years back by common review mission it has highlighted the problems with manrega such as uh, the wage rates are really low secondly the scheme of manrega was supposed to be supply driven instead of demand driven uh, uh, the scheme was supposed to be demand driven but it has actually become supply driven so uh, it's the duty of gram sabhas etc to provide uh, uh, allocate work provide for jobs immediately but this is not happening they provide uh, jobs uh, they create work at their own whims and fancies so actually it was supposed to be demand driven but it has actually become supply driven uh, this you, you can use and secondly delay in wage payment as i have already told and states are unable to complete work on schedule so this is the problem with manrega and this is the news which has actually come up moving on merely drafting a national tourism policy not enough need a tourism council parliamentary committee so parliamentary standing committee on transport tourism and culture has actually suggested the fast tracking of the creation of national tourism council on the lines of gst council to directly make recommendations to central and state governments on various issues also they have recommended that tourism should be made uh, the concurrent issue so that because tourism actually generates lot actually happens a lot through states only but again the, the committee notes that some 20 states are yet to accord industry status to the hospitality projects and has asked ministry to like what what is happening in this regard and also they have flagged the issue of a lot of projects uh, tourism projects uh, seeing cost overruns so they have warned the ministry and they have said that covid actually exacerbated the problem of tourism industry and tourism industry provides lots of employment so they have actually asked uh, to look into this next important issue as i have told you india's emerging crisis of representation the issue has come up with respect to delimitation and how there are news that uh, the present government might increase the number of uh, MPs in Lok Sabha and a new parliamentary building is coming up which has actually around some 846 seats for member of parliament so people are concocting that this might be that government of India might be willing to increase the uh, frozen Lok Sabha seats which are as of now 545 representatives so a lot of MPs from South India have actually raised the issue that they are being punished uh, for actually implementing the uh, population policy and controlling the population burst. And the Bimari states are actually uh, represented more in parliament. And uh, so see, the, this delimitation exercise is actually governed by Article 81 and 82 of the Constitution of India. And 81 talks about the proportionality of uh, population, etc based on the principle of one man one vote and article 82 actually says that the constituencies have to be rejigged or uh, constituencies have to be reframed uh, uh, based on the census which happens every 10 years but to 2021 census has actually not happened uh, there are no plans to that actually it will be happening so uh, uh, south indian states are actually complaining that in future since they have actually better control the population growth their representation will actually reduce in if, if the number of seats are actually increased eventually the proportionally they will actually uh, uh, get less representation and it's like punishing them for better implementation of population pol uh, policies 
so in 2019 a uh, paper was published uh, by <coughs> paper was published by milan bashnav and james hinston known as india's emerging crisis of representation where they have actually uh, uh, projected that how the freezing of delimitation based on 1971 census firstly by indira gandhi government and secondly by atal bihari vajpayee government in 2002 uh they have frozen that no changes would happen actually happen uh till 2026 although internal restructuring is allowed this was a, uh, done in, by a 2003 amendment act so uh, uh they have written on it and they say that if a new parliament if if number of seats are being increased it's quite possible that the representation of southern states might decrease from 23 23% which is as of now to mere 19% almost one fourth and the representation of the bimaru states or the hindi heartland which is uh, like up and bihar which uh, jharkhand rajasthan etc which produce which have still not been able to control their population the representation might increase from 39% which is now to some 44.6% in in the future so you see the southern states uh, they will have less representation and the northern states will have more representation but again the northern states says that when you have frozen to uh, the delimitation to 1971 consensus uh, census you have actually violated the uh, uh, the rule of one man one vote because we are underrepresented there we should be actually having more representation so this problem of mal apportionment was actually studied by the political scientist alistair macmillan back in 2001 only and you uh, the political science students may actually uh, make use of his name alistair macmillan uh, macmillan a l i i s t a i r m c m i l l a n and he he actually showed that how uh, this freezing actually uh, disturbs one man one vote vote principle uh, so this is the debate actually a lot of questions were being raised in in your uh, recently happening uh, winter session so that's why i have uh, tried to uh, bring this debate for you <coughs> again moving on there is uh, another news that in up uh, uh, the lucknow bench of allahabad high court actually uh, 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 came down heavily on the government of up for not conducting the obc uh, survey and uh, uh, for giving them reservation in urban local body elections and another urban local body elections are due in up uh, it's mandatory to do uh, complete those elections under article 243 uh, u and uh, uh, actually uh, the honorable supreme court in its one of its 2010 judgment actually came up with a triple test to actually provide reservation in ur urban local bodies the triple test includes setting up a dedicated commission to conduct a contemporaneous rigorous empirical inquiry into the nature and implications of backwardness co local bodies within the state the second test is specifying the proportion of reservation required to be provisioned local body wise in light of recommendations of the commission so as not to fall foul of overbreath and not exceeding an aggregate 50% of total seats reserved in favor of sc st obcs taken together okay so this is the triple test up government failed to actually appoint a commission it's just not commission that you have to say you have to actually also prove the reasonability about why certain certain reservation in the light of backwardness has to be given and recently supreme court has actually struck down uh, similar uh, urban local body reservation in maharashtra in odisha in madhya pradesh madhya pradesh recently have appointed a commission so this actually news becomes important with a vis a vis debate with regard to uh, reservation for urban uh, for obcs in urban local bodies and also again the demand for caste census okay you can link these two issues so uh, these were the major issues uh, taking place around uh, internationally nationally last but not the least i found this quote in hindu you may practice an essay around it vision without action is a daydream an action without a vision is a nightmare okay so try writing around it it's a philosophical topic i so this is what we did to, in today's session uh, make use of it kindly make your notes and uh, uh be safe uh, covid wave is again here uh, is presumed to be here next 40 days are crucial 
uh, we'll see you next week have a good day